So, Michelle Hegman is our speaker tonight, and uh, one wonderful thing about Michelle is that she is a graduated from the U University of Michigan, so I have to have a <laughs> shout out for the University of Michigan. Uh, I was only an undergraduate there uh, before coming out here, but Michelle has been active in the archaeology of the Southwest, and I think over time in her teaching, in her working with students, this idea of there's really a lot of questions that aren't heavily sciencey when they're asked, and yet they're really kind of questions that get at what were people doing in the past. And so I think Michelle has come up with a really creative kind of approach to uh, talking about, thinking about, and, and communicating about the past, and it's this archaeology of the human experience that is going to be the topic of her talk tonight. So with that, I'm going to let Michelle come up and uh, share her uh, research and thoughts uh, with all of you. Michelle. Working. All right. Um, and Bill not only uh, generously made this introduction, but he also wrote the foreword to the book that it should be out any day now, um, called The Archaeology of the Human Experience, which is, is what this is based on. So did some of you see in the last couple of days uh, the announcement of the Pulitzer Prize? Of course, the New York Times got a Pulitzer, or got several Pulitzers, and one of them was for a series of photographs of um, the refugees mostly coming to Greece. Did you see that? Uh, I'm sure even if you didn't see that series of pictures, um, if your eyes have been open in the last year, you've seen some of them. Uh, the, probably the classic one is all of those people on this tiny little boat coming close to shore. And regardless of what you think about the refugee crisis or if and how you think it could be solved, those pictures were heartrending. They are about the human condition of these poor people who are stuck um, so it's interesting in the sense that you, you can feel what they're going through. It's important because it's about what the world is going through these days. And it's also very understandable. If you saw those pictures, there's some of them where you see the emotion in people's faces. You see the man, tears in, coming down his face, holding his child, he's made it. They've survived. But there's also pictures where you're not even seeing faces. Uh, the one that got me the most is people just literally crammed in like sardines on top of one another, sleeping. Um, it just tells you what it's like. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have to explain the emotions, you don't have to interview people to find out what they think about it. You just see that picture and you know what it was like. So I'm, I don't expect to get a Pulitzer, um, but what the archaeology of the human experience is about is trying to get across some of that same um, level of feeling. Um, it's interesting, it's about the human condition. It's important because it's getting us closer to answers to questions that archaeologists have been asking for a long time. And it's important because it's also helping, pushing archaeologists towards answering the questions that non-academic archaeologists ask all the time, like what did people do here? Did they have enough food? Was it cold? Was it hot? How did they get their water up here? All of these questions um, non-professionals are constantly asking us when, we, when they visit our sites, and we haven't been thinking about them because we're too worried about the jargon that goes into our journals. So it's important for that reason too. And it's also, um, as I hope you'll see as I, as I talk along, it's completely doable. I'm not talking about trying to do the psychology of the past or making up stories about what people might have been doing. I'm talking about understanding the conditions of their lives. Again, things as simple as did they have enough food. So let me give you a little bit of background to how I got to here, and then I'll tell you about some of the research uh, that I've been doing and that my students have been doing. It started out in a paper, and I can't believe this was almost 10 years ago, published in 2008, um, where a, a group of colleagues and I did a comparison among several cases of um, 
basically of abandonment and change in the Southwest. And one of the variables that we were looking at, uh, we ended up calling human suffering. And the evidence for human suffering was warfare or some kind of conflict or um, nutritional problems, disease problems. So when, when we saw one of those things, we said human suffering, more here, less there. The paper was fine, people liked it. We were quite proud of ourselves for actually talking about human suffering um, rather than just talking about pot shirt counts. Uh, and so we tried to use the same approach for another paper that was going into a journal that was more sciency, and it just got canned. I've never had reviews like that. Um, it wasn't fix this, fix that, it was no. You can't do that. Um, we were told that we could talk about morbidity and mortality rates, but we can't talk about what people are feeling or experiencing. Um, so I got mad, that's the first reaction when you get rejected. Uh, but I also read, the, after a while, I read the reviews, and one of the things that they were saying that I thought was correct is that we were a little bit too glib in saying suffering. Um, not all nutritional problems, not even all warfare is just total suffering. And we really needed to use that S word much more carefully. So that's what led to the archaeology of the human experience. And what it did is it made us think about how we could get at experience. And now I want to say it's not just suffering. Um, it, this started out with the suffering, it started out with the bad stuff, but how we could get at experience more broadly, um, but also do it systematically. And there's lots of ways, there's lots of insights, but one of the ones that we started with that I think has been really successful is the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP, came up with, uh, this is in 1994, they came up with seven dimensions of what they called human security. And the idea here is that nations are always worried about their national security, and we are too. Um, but that national security is at this broad level, and you also need to be thinking about what's life like on the ground. So the human securities, and there's seven of these, are food security, health security, economic security, community security, environmental, political, Anyone remember? Oh, and personal. Personal is freedom from violence. Um, and the nice thing about those is that it gave us a link between things that are really relevant in the contemporary world and the kinds of things that archaeologists study. Um, because most of those things we study all the time. We study subsistence systems. Um, we study violence. We study the environment and human impact on the environment. We study community organization. Um, so we could do those things. And we started using that framework. Some people used all seven of them. Some people um, focused particularly on one or two um, to, tr to look at change over time and to see, okay, how did this change affect food security? How did it affect personal security? Um, and that, that led to this archeology span of the human experience. And the way I've been defining it, the way I do in the, um, the book that Bill wrote the foreword to, is that we've got, uh, it's got four components. The first is understanding the conditions of life. Um, you know, what were people doing all day? What, what was it like to live here? The second is relating those conditions to, to uh, more general sociocultural things. Are the conditions pretty much spread evenly across the, the site, or um, did some people have better conditions than others? How did it change over time? which gets into the third one. And then the fourth, which is the hardest, and the one I'm actually gonna talk about the least here, is when we can get insights into what people actually felt. So I think when people hear experience, what they immediately start thinking of is, well, how can you get at that? You don't know what they felt. And it's true, we don't know what they felt. Um, but I don't know what those refugees felt lying in their sardine sleeping place. But it's, seeing that picture is still important. So every once in a while, archaeologists can get in, gain insight into what people felt. There's even a book out now on the archaeology of warfare and anxiety, and I think it's got some pretty good um, insights. But what I'm uh, arguing is that we can get at the conditions, and that in itself is really important. Um, we don't have to delve into the prehistoric psychology.
So um, I want to give you a few examples of the kind of research that we're doing with this. Uh, Kate's not here, is she, Kate Gunn? Okay. Um, one of the people who works at Archaeology Southwest, Kate Gunn, Gan? Gan, um, wrote this great blog post. I actually don't read blog posts very often, but someone sent this to me, and it was just perfect. Um, you know the word occupation? And you think about occupation in the news today, what do you think of? Job. Hmm? A job. A job? Oh, a job, that's true. I was thinking of um, the army occupying, uh, Israel's occupying the West Bank, that kind of thing. But archaeologists like, use that word constantly to mean, I don't even know what, to mean that people lived at this site for 100 years. Um, they, we would say the occupation lasted for 100 years. And she said that as an editor, because she's trained in English, amazingly enough, as well as in archaeology, this word drives her crazy. Um, because it really doesn't mean anything. It doesn't, it, it implies things like a job for you or um, an army occupation that archaeologists don't mean. So I started, well, I did a word search and I was shocked to find out how many times I'd used that word. And it starts to pull you around to having to write differently. Instead of saying the site was occupied for 100 years, you have to say people lived at the site for 100 years. And you, so you start writing in a way that puts people into your sentences. And what that brought up for me, my um, primary research area is in southwest New Mexico in Membrace archaeology. What that brought up to me is every time I started writing about the people living at the site rather than the occupation, I started looking more and more at the differences among the different people. And we know that there was a pretty strong land tenure system there. Um, the earliest people who moved in established uh, their places in the best land, and later people who moved in um, were sort of on the peripheries. So as we started thinking about um, what are the people doing rather than the occupation of the site, it started leading to a lot of insights about how um, the rise of the classic and then the end when people started leaving um, would have people would have had a very different trajectory depending on whether they were first comers or late comers. Um, that for the first comers, the end of the classic, the end of that land tenure system would have been um, not so great. But for the later comers, um, it would have been an opportunity. So it's, it's sort of a way of evaluating, um, for an archeologist who loves membrace pottery, the end of the classic is a tragedy because they quit making those beautiful designs. Um, but for the people, especially the latecomers, who came a little bit later and who didn't have access to that land tenure system, um, the end of the classic might have been a nice opportunity. Um, so that was one of the insights, one of the, in some ways, less rigorous insights that came from simply trying to write in a slightly different way. Um, I'm not trying to say what the people felt. I'm just trying to make people the subject of my sentences. Um, and that changes quite a lot in, uh, not just in communicating with non-academic audiences, but in the thought processes that go on in um, my, own, my own writing. Um, another example is, some of you may know the work of Scott Ortman, one of our ASU grads. He's now at the University of Colorado, and he worked for a long time on the movement of people from the Mesa Verde region in southwest Colorado um, to northern New Mexico around Santa Fe. And it's basically, it's pretty clear that the people who lived in the Mesa Verde region become, became the people who are now the Tewa. And we know, archaeologists have known for probably 100 years that the population in the Mesa Verde region went down as the population in the Tewa region went up. At the same time, it still seemed puzzling that um, the people had moved from here to there because in the Tewa region, the material culture, the pottery, the architecture, just about everything you could think of um, was very different. And so if you go up to the Mesa Verde, where did they go? It's a mystery, we don't know. We know exactly, they moved to the Tewa region. And what Scott started figuring out is um, by working with this archaeology of the human experience 
idea, he started getting some ideas of why it's so puzzling, and particularly why they changed the material culture and how that fits into the whole um, migration. So he's one of the ones who used all seven of those dimensions of human security. Um, and he figured out ways of measuring food security uh, before the migration, sort of immediately after, and then um, about 50 years later. So in, for f food security, personal security, economic security, health security, environmental security, community, and political, he figured out ways of measuring all of those. Um, one of the more clever ones for economic security was he used a measure that economists um, use today, and that's a ratio of what they call um, what they call normal goods to necessary goods. Necessary goods are things that you need one of. Um, an example is a can opener. No matter how fancy your kitchen is, you probably don't have more than one or two can openers. There's nothing very cool about them. Normal goods are these things that we always want more of. Um, how many flip-flops do I have? More than I need. Um, so uh, as the ratio of normal goods to necessary goods goes up, it's considered to be um, a sign of economic prosperity. And apparently economists go around and they're actually counting up the number of shoes or the number of t-shirts or whatever people have um, as, a, as an indicator of prosperity. So that's, that's one of the ways that Scott figured out to measure this. And what he found with all some of, seven of those dimensions is that things weren't very good um, before people left the Mesa Verde region. Um, they were actually pretty bad. And immediately after they left, um, they continued to not be so good. But then over time, about 50 years later, all of those things had gotten better. Um, and one of the main things that had gotten better is uh, that warfare pretty much went away. The end of the Mesa Verde region was a really bad time. Um, there's evidence of massacres, uh, lots of fighting, lots of competition, um, sort of an increase in social hierarchy. And putting these things together, his argument, and I, I really like this argument, is that people left because things were really going badly, um, not just climate, but everything else on top of that. Um, but when they left, they were able to reinvent themselves. They were able to reinvent the society, and that's why we don't see it so well archaeologically because they needed, um, they were sort of throwing away their old forms of organization, um, their old forms of pottery, um, and reinventing themselves. And what they did is they reinvented a society that seems to be prospering, um, and prospered even through uh, the colonialism, and they're still doing well today. And the Tewa people can really resonate with this story, the idea that so at some time in their past, uh, their ancestors made mistakes. Um, they had worked themselves into this society that wasn't working very well, um, and they figured out how to fix it. So um, rather than treating the warfare in the Southwest, which we're getting more and more and more and more um, evidence of, rather than treating that as something terrible, it's sort of become an optimistic story of people moving beyond that. Um, and there's even an article now the Kohler et al. 2014, where they show, they look at the relationship between the level of conflict and the level of subsistence stress. So um, they've got all sorts of data on paleo productivity, on um, how much corn people could have grown each year. And in the Mesa Verde region, as there's more subsistence stress, there's more violence, which is kind of what you'd expect. Things are bad, so people start fighting. But what's really interesting is that after they left, after they moved to the Tewa region, um, subsistence stress does go up at times, but it doesn't seem to prompt violence. So again, people figured out how to do it, and they figured out how to do it better. Um, so I think those are really neat conclusions, but the other part I want to emphasize is this, these, are, these are very clever uses of the kind of data that archaeologists know how to gather. Um, we know how to count potsherds. Unfortunately, we know how to um, evaluate uh, skeletal remains, or at least bioarchaeologists who help us do. Um, so it's just using some of these data 
to get at new kinds of questions. Uh, another example um, is, does, has Mike Smith talked at this? No, you should get him. Um, Mike Smith, who's a professor at ASU, has been doing a, he's, he worked for a long time on Aztec cities. And his research now is broadening from just talking about Aztec cities um, to doing comparative urban studies. So he's looking at ancient and historic cities and in relation to some issues in modern cities. And if you read any literature on modern cities, there's a lot of, there's a big component of environmental justice. Who ends up living beside the nasty places? Who gets pushed out when um, something's being expanded? Who's mostly exposed to um, polluting factories? And you know the answer, right? The poor. Um, what, and so they're able to do the same kind of work uh, looking at things archeologically, but in a kind of nice reversal, rather than looking at who lives closer to the bad stuff, they're looking at who lives close to the urban services. Um, so they've got different kinds of services, religious services, marketplaces, um, and looking at the relationship between uh, people's wealth, basically commoners versus elites, and um, who has more access to them. And of course, the answer is somewhat what you'd expect. Um, the elites tend to have more access. Uh, but they can sort out how this is different in different cities, and um, also how, f how much the difference is. And what I'm trying to push them to do is to also start looking at, okay, if, if you had to go from here where you live to the market, what would that actually involve? How do you get there? Do you ride a donkey? Is that no big deal? Do you have to go through dangerous neighborhoods? Do you have to cross a river? Um, so they get more and more at this idea of what were people actually doing in the past? Um, because we can, we, if we ask that question, we can pretty much, we can get a lot of insights if we just ask the right question. So, where do I wanna go? Oh, and then one other um, person, Deb Martin, I think she talked last, month in Tucson. She's a bioarchaeologist at the UNLV, University of Las Vegas. So she studies skeletons. And she's just done a book called The Bioarchaeology of Violence, where she's trying to understand not just that people got whacked on the head, but what are the causes of um, violence in different settings, and to try to understand why there's more or less violence in different places. And as she's been, she's, so we've been kind of coordinating the bioarchaeology of the human experience with the archaeology of the human experience. And one of her studies in this regard has been to look not just at what is the trauma that she can see in the bones, but what would the actual experience of that trauma be? And this involves just doing work with clinical, uh, clinical medical people today. You know, what's it like if you get hit in this part of your head? How does that affect? How does that affect you? Does it affect your walking? Does it affect your brain? Does it affect your speech, your memory? Um, that stuff is knowable. I mean, they know it today, and um, it's, the anatomy is the same. Um, so she's been able to really look at uh, what would people's experience of these injuries be, rather than simply kind of tabulating the, you know, the broken bones of, of different kinds. So let me, um, I'm teaching a class now, we have one week left, um, called The Archaeology of the Human Experience, where the graduate students are trying to take this approach and push it forward. I don't know the results yet, um, but just the, some of their paper topics are pretty interesting. So I want to tell you about a couple of those um, and then wrap, wrap up the talking part. One student, I was talking to Kathy about this, so you all have some idea of Hoakam canals. You probably have a good idea. They're unfathomably enormous. And the amount of work that went into making them is just beyond my comprehension. And we have these labor estimates where we know roughly, very, very roughly, you know, how many person hours went into making these, the main canals. And if we take it further, we can figure out, okay, um, how many person hours went into making the side canals and all of these other parts. Um, so the person hours, that part is doable. The part that we don't know 
and that I think is also quite answerable is what did that actually mean for the people who were doing it? So are we talking about a thousand person hours spread across a um, hundred people who each had to work 10 hours a month, which would not be so much? Or are we talking about so many person hours given the population that uh, people would have basically having, needing to work um, almost all of their daylight hours. That kind of thing should be answerable with some uh, reasonable population estimates, reasonable ideas. They're gonna, it's gonna be ballpark, but it's at least gonna give us some idea of what, what is the impact of this labor on people's, people's lives. Another part is that there's a pretty good calendar of Hohokam agricultural activities that's linked to um, ethnographic evidence. And the, the, so the students are looking at the calendar of agricultural activities in relation to the labor of digging canals. And what, what they're finding so far is that it looks like a lot of that labor was probably compressed into a fair, fairly short time when there wasn't as much agricultural labor that would have needed to be done. And that people were at their limits. Um, that there wasn't a lot of surplus labor to go around, which you could probably imagine if you've ever tried to dig into dirt. Um, and then another one that I think is pretty neat is you probably also are aware of the, the extent to which Hoacom pottery was exchanged all over the valley. Right? That's not a surprise. Um, and it, again, it's huge, huge amounts. Uh, there are sites where Las Colinas, where the, the, ba the settling basin where they made the clay is probably bigger than this part of the room. I mean, there's so much um, volume of pots. But the pots don't walk. The pots have to be carried. And some of these pots are big. Um, so we've got really good data. Dave Abbott has really good data on how many pots were made here and how many of them moved here, and you know, there's these pots here that move there. Um, but the idea is just so, somehow that the pots moved. Um, what the students are starting to do is make calculations about, okay, how many pots actually moved over what period of time, and how much labor would that have been? How much would they have weighed? How many pots can a person carry? Does that mean that once a month you carry one load full, or does that mean that um, you need to be sort of have a, a labor stream constantly carrying them. It's another one of these questions that's pretty knowable if we just do the calculations. And once we have the answer, that gives us a much better idea of what people's lives were like, um, of what they were doing all day, of um, how that would have affected their body, and then how these things fit into their, their economic system. Okay. So um, my goals with this a lot of the goal is to inspire students, which seems to be working. Um, one of my goals is, I think, a simple one, and I think it's getting there, because there's an article out now on the smells of a site called Çatalhöyük in Turkey. Um, with, and it's a, in a respected journal, in the Journal of Anthropological Archaeology, and this, the, the woman who wrote it is simply describing all the different things that would have contributed to smells. Period. And I think that's great, um, because what it's saying is that what life was like is a proper topic for our research. We have all sorts of articles about um, the subsistence system or uh, the socioeconomic system. I mean, all these topics that we're allowed to write articles on. And um, it seems as though the archaeology of the human experience, what was life like, um, needs to also be a topic that we write articles about, that are accepted in major journals, that that's something we should be trying to understand. Um, I think that's important because it helps us understand some of the other questions that archaeologists are always asking. Why did they leave? Why did they fight? Um, why are they organized the way they are? Their experience is a big part of that answer. And it also brings in and makes less boring the uh, academic archaeology for um, other audiences, because we should be talking about people. Um, we're social scientists. Most of us got interested in the past because we wanted to know what people were doing in the past. 
and it's sort of bringing that back into it. Um, so I'm hoping that the archaeology of the human experience can, can really create a link between um, doing these studies that tell us what people were actually doing in the past, uh, the questions that most people who are not academic archaeologists are interested in about the past, and answers to questions that academic archaeologists often ask, especially the why questions, the big questions. You can't answer big questions about what people, why things happened in the past without understanding what life was like. Um, so that's where we're going with this, and I'd be glad to answer questions or talk more about it. I'd like to know if there's more insight into the journeys that the people uh, had to make uh, to uh, do the trade routes and how that might have uh, played out in your book. Um, there, there is quite a lot of information that's not in the book um, about trails uh, in the Hoakam regions. This is mostly work done um, down in the Gila River Indian Reservation. And so they don't want people walk, I mean, they don't want us walking on the trails, but they do know where a lot of those trails were. Um, that would, it would be a hard one. There, there was a branch of archeology span a while ago called phenomenological archeology span where archeologists, in other words, white people, we're walking along in uh, looking at Neolithic British sites and then trying to describe what they felt. Um, and it was controversial because the idea was, well, if I'm feeling this, the people in the past would have felt it, which I don't quite buy. At the same time, I think walking along those trails, if we were allowed to, would give us insights. Um, which isn't a completely good answer to your question. We, there's more and more work being done on both using feet and using GIS. How do you get from this point to that point? And I think it's important to do both. I mean, to, if, to, if possible, to actually do the walk and to figure out with GIS how can you best do that walk. Um, there's one study at the uh, Cerro de Trincher Trincheras, these sites in northern Mexico. Um, and they've always been talked about as being defensive. And one of the defensive features is basically it's, there, it's just a hillside and it's a lot of rocks on the hillside. But what the argument is, and there's nice pictures of them, is that obviously those rocks aren't gonna stop someone. Um, but if you're attacking and you're running, it's gonna be hard to cross over those rocks. And so simply the experience of what would it have been like to go over the rocks is, is part of it. So. I, I do hope that some, if people um, take this and go with it, they, they're thinking, they're actually getting out there and thinking about some of these things, about what would, it, what would it have been like to move across the landscape. The other part that's harder to do is knowing what the landscape would be like culturally. It, would it be hostile? Would you be afraid? Would you have friends? That's, that's tougher. You look, you look I, familiar. I have a reputation for asking questions. I just have a small one this time. The idea of trails uh -huh. sounds like a good one. And I don't think we only have to worry about Gila River. There's plenty of other places in Arizona and out of the way places where you can find trails. Mm -hmm. And it's known among a lot of Indian communities that trails, they keep the same trails over the generations. And you know, trading is a big thing. And I've heard people say, oh, you can't compare today's trade with other trade. Or how can we say that people in the past, uh, like paleo times, we know in paleo times they traded somehow to get special rocks for special points. Mm -hmm. And that's thousands of years ago. These trails go for on forever. And the idea of bringing up trails, um, so Gila River doesn't want you walking around on their res. Fine, find another place. It can be done. And it would be interesting. Oh yeah, um, you know, no doubt. It, actually figuring out what it was like to go from here to there would be interesting. Craig Child, who uh, gets criticized a lot for archeology, by archeologists because he's not technically an archeologist, does this a lot in the Northern Southwest. I mean, he walks, he 
covers, he goes out there for 100 days and covers the ground. And he's not pretending that he's doing it like a prehistoric person, but he's got some idea of what it's like to actually do this. That just reminded me of Douglas Preston's trying to recreate Coronado's expedition. And he discovered some really interesting things about what they thought was the, hmm. the route because he said apparently the person he talked to didn't understand what all those closely spaced lines meant on a topo map because there was no way you could have taken horses and wagons and cattle down the, the slope that they recommended. That's interesting, yeah. I mean, so some of this, it is, there's a lot of common sense that you know, you got to get out and ground truth some of these things. Well, you're... Initial experience was that uh, suggested that maybe other archaeologists are the biggest quote enemies of uh, the anthropology of, or archaeology of human experience in terms of the reaction to your uh, treatment of suffering and so on. So, when you worked with your group of uh, in the the recent book, the folks that you were sort of hurting, um, <laughs> yeah, you got as herded. Cats. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. What kinds of pushback have you gotten from other archaeologists, or what kind of buy-in do you see um, in terms of your experience? I'm seeing mostly buy-in, um, in large part because we're trying to be systematic about it, which is my inclination anyhow. That I, I don't want to just make up stories. I don't find it very satisfying. Um, if anything, some of the pushback is we already know that. And I think that's partly true, but we need to know it more coherently. Um, we know how to do these things, but we're still not putting people back into the, into the picture quite as much. Uh, there hasn't been much pushback. I mean, since we've stopped talking about suffering, suffering, suffering everywhere, um, it's been okay. The other thing that is working pretty well is it seems to be, those of you who have been with archaeology for a while, when we started figuring out that there was violence in the Southwest, it was really hard to deal with because Southwestern people were supposed to be peaceful and the fact that we found violence was somehow disrespectful. And thinking about their experience and thinking about the fact that they what, what it would have been like for them in the past and that they maybe could get past that it, it seems to be, rather than sensationalizing the violence, it's, it seems to be putting it in a light that makes, makes it okay to talk about. Other questions? Well, I think okay. you're on the right track, thanks. Michelle, and thank you for sharing this with everyone.